Welcome to the second part of our Berlin tour. We have more great guests to talk to today and we have more great reports from around the city. And we are sitting here in Aletto Hotel uh, in the lobby. It's a shared space and shared space was the topic of the year for us, Florian. Absolutely. We talked a lot about shared spaces. It started at Euroshop 2020, which is the biggest retail fair. And together with a client of us, Wisplay, and the whole family of their other companies, we built dreams, we built shared spaces. And um, we believe, or the architects behind it, believe that um, spaces will be used in different things. You will use them in the morning, different in the evening. We're here in a hotel lobby. So this hotel lobby can be converted just with a, with a curtain to a meeting room for example the furniture can be can be placed differently and you have a big meeting room and this is not only essential for retail or for hospitality but especially for offices as we all know with the pen with the pandemic the use of meeting rooms the use of um, large offices has changed dramatically and we have some really interesting people we met here and uh, shared spaces is relevant to all these things so digital is important digital can give flexibility but also the shop fitting and the whole design around it needs to be flexible Stefan, should we start it? I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. Me too. Let's go. Henrik, we are sitting here in the lobby of the Aletto Hotel, a beautiful space, a shared space, a topic that has been on our minds a lot this year. Can you tell us a little bit about how the space was created? What was the idea behind it? Sure, it was actually a very simple process. We tried to change in 2014-15 because we no longer operated certain hotels and were looking for new solutions. What can you actually do with spaces starting at 10, 11 in the morning? Because we have very high customer frequency, a lot of people who are in the house at the same time, who we have to handle simultaneously, so they can either go sightseeing the city or have to leave on business at 9 in the morning at the latest. And these simultaneous activities always lead to the fact that we have a lot of guest traffic in a short period of time, basically one to two hours. After that, the lobbies are usually empty in the hotel industry. And then, of course, you think, what I do with these spaces? This is a so-called hotel graveyard from 11 in the morning. We wanted to get around that and started to look for solutions. What can you create? And then we created a showcase hotel for Europe with Vitra in terms of furnishing. We went to Weil am Rhein and took a look at their portfolio. And then, as it sometimes happens, we visited the Visplay showroom. And when we saw the Visplay solutions and what you can do with modular retail systems to convert spaces in a short time with very simple means, it just clicked in our heads. And then we said, man, it's a great concept to create dedicated spaces within the building in order to make mass use of the location. In particular, we can integrate the trade fair center across the street. And that was the original idea of shared spaces for micro fairs, order fairs, pop-up events and at the same time use the space for breakfast and to create an experience for the guests. Those were the original thoughts how we came to this whole thing. That means you actually completely changed the space for an event once the first batch of guests left the hotel. The space is either converted while the guests are still having breakfast or it's prepared in advance. Because of the large space we have in the public area, we also have the option of managing guest traffic in such a way that the customer has breakfast in our building B or here in the middle of the lobby. But it should also be a space where guests staying with us can also enjoy the experience. It should not only be with companies who, for example, host their micro order or fair or pop-up events, the guest should experience it. He should experience something new every day. So next time you come, maybe there's a car show in the back of the stage area with the latest mini model. Or the guest finds the latest fashion from Marco Polo or Hugo Boss in the breakfast area. And that's the idea we're following here, an always convertible space that can be optimally used within the smallest possible footprint. 
The concept was, of course, planned before COVID. The pandemic heavily challenged the hotel industry. How did you react to that? Did it help you? Well, that was a really a challenge, but in the end, we had two advantages. One was, we have a lot of space available. A lot of hotel operators don't have that. They need to squeeze everything into a small lobby, where guests spend time and have breakfast, and then they're back in town. That was a huge advantage, that we have enough space for safe distancing. Of course, on the one hand, for our normal guests, and at the same time, we had the opportunity to offer something to companies as well. Hey, you can still do your trade show of your, or your events right in the pandemic. You are safe, you are secure, that's why we got our DECRA seal. We are one of the few hotels nationwide able to fulfill all criteria according to WHO standards. It was very important to gain this trust, that guests know I can stay here, I can do business here. And so we are also able to attract companies that then exhibited their products and could selectively invite either their top sellers or their customers. Here you are very efficient. You can quickly set up a store, you can put up your goods in the spotlight, we have all the furniture on site and you don't need any planning, you don't need a painter, a drywaller, nothing that is usually expensive. And so we also offer a lot of sustainability. That means we don't throw anything away. As a company, you can create your space, whatever you want. We provide the furniture and you can start right away. That was actually perfect in Corona times. And we were lucky that we did it that way and we benefited at the end. It was also perfect for our interviews this week. We also used various spots here in the hotel. For us, that was great. Of course, I'm also interested in the digital part. We are talking about digital in the show. What is used here and how is it used? Digital has also been very important for us. You are absolutely right, Stefan. Guests are using more and more media. We can also see that in the booking behavior. People are booking more via smartphone and our rooms can be open with a phone. With digital, we wanted to support the whole experience. Also try to achieve an effect from the outside. For example, when a trade fair is taking place across the street, we use these NEC displays so you can see what's happening here in the hotel. Or it's an extension of the trade show. Visitors to the trade show area see what's happening here and get lured to the events inside the hotel. It's like a retail storefront. Exactly. To overcome that barrier, we also present our restaurant menu outside to show what's available. It's not only outdoor advertising, but we also have welcome screens inside. For example, the video wall, when you come in. We use this wall as a welcome board for content, as an information screen for guests to see what's happening in the city or in the hotel. At the same time, companies can utilize the screen as well and show their advertising, their message, so everybody knows what's going on. You can take these NEC displays, attach them anywhere to the multi-lane structure, which is fully powered. It's very simple. You load up the content and that's how you create a space. On the guest floors we have implemented frames that serve as televisions, monitors or info points. In the rooms we have also duplicated this. Any Android phone can be quickly mirrored on the TV. This way we have complete package including elevator design. It's a setup we really enjoy and which is easy to manage. Also wir, wir persönlich haben den Aufenthalt ja. hier genossen, für Schön. uns war es super und mhm. äh, ja, wir wünschen euch alles Gute für die Zukunft. Ja, danke Super. für den Besuch, hat Spaß gemacht. Hi Peter, great to have you here. Hi, Today we have here Peter from Green City Solutions and um, you're a Berlin-based startup in the um, green city, in the green city world and um, you created, invented a really cool product. Maybe you can give us a short introduction, what you're doing and how your solution changes uh, our life in the city. Absolutely. Thanks for having me here. Um, we invented a called Moss Module. So we took something out of nature. It's a green organism and it has the capacity of filtering air pollutants like fine dust, like oxides and we use this technology to bring products into the city. The first product is the city tree, 
and the city tree has the ability of filtering the air of 7,000 people every hour by just taking out these particles out of the air. Oh, great. So how does it really work? Do you just have to put some moss there or does it also need some technology around it? Absolutely necessary <laughs> to have some technology there. We bring these mosses into our product and we maintain them there with the right water, with the right amount of air, because we actively suck in the air and pull them through the mosses, push them through the mosses, and then uh, it's like a filter medium you maybe know from a HIPAA filter. It's yep. kind of the similar thing, but the big difference is that these mosses have the ability to digest these particles so they can renew themselves. So therefore we can use them for a couple of time. So I have to clean them every, every couple of days or weeks or so? How does it work? Or does it clean it itself? Is it like a lotus? Or <laughs> it, it definitely cleans themselves. Uh, we are in the middle of the research of how long does it take and how it directly works it out. And we see that it's between one month and a bit more that they are regenerating themselves. So you can refill them with pollutants from time to time, all the time. Now I think we understand how the moss works, how the invention works, but how does the structure look like? Is it like a, is it like a, a, a big column or how does it look like? How, where is it integrated? So the city tree is like a, a cube, a, a wooden cube, uh, three meters high, one meter to one meter wide. And inside of this city tree, you have the moss modules, you have also the technology, you have also weather sensors and um, uh, different other sensors, and you have place for another technologies for the smart city approach. So you can plug in other sensors in our platform, you can plug in also hardware things, and therefore we have a multifunctional tool where you also can sit there and you can rest there, you have Wi-Fi hotspot, and therefore uh, it's, a, it's a tool to be there within the city. That's really cool. So it's much more than just technology. And you mentioned platform. I think that's very relevant because there are many players out there who you know, say, oh, we can put some moss in there and then we solve the world, we <laughs> solve the climate. And, but I think it's a technology and the data you're also collecting there because the sensor is not only collecting data for your solution, but I think you can also, you know, you, you collect this data and then you share this also with cities or some other players in the market, right? Correct. Absolutely necessary. The moss uh, alone wouldn't change the things uh, as we filter with a proactive system. So we really stress these mosses out with a, a huge filter volume. We need to know if they are okay, if they are vital. And therefore we are tracking a lot of sensors around these mosses and about the performance itself. And that's something we can also show with inhabitants of the city, with the decision makers, with our clients. And they can showcase it directly on the city tree with a huge screen or an info board where they have access to these data and yeah. therefore you can get a better understanding in, in terms of uh, how good is the environment and how big the performance of this product is. I think it's very relevant to all the smart cities and green cities things. You need to you know, have this solution but you also need to share it with your inhabitants. If you don't do that then it's very difficult to understand you know, what, the, what the value of, of these new structures in this in city is. That's very important um, as we have also the thing from the beginning of our invention it was always the most frequently asked question, how good is this filter? And it took a long time to, to get the scientific research and the results out of that to make the proof of concept. And now we know that it's very, very important to share the data, to make a lot of data, to get a better understanding on where to place the city trees. You mentioned it, just one or two city trees in the city wouldn't make a difference, but the very precise and exact placing is very important because not everywhere is pollution, not everywhere are people, and we try to combine these two things, where pollution, pollution and people are meet each other, there we have to place. So um, that means we have to place them close to the roadside where, most, where the most pollution is or where would it be ideal? It's, it's pretty interesting how cities itself work in the context of um, pollution because you see uh, pollution clouds can go through uh, a huge distance. So you may know about the Sahara wind yeah. bringing particles from the Sahara into Berlin. So there you can see that it's, it's a complex and global thing. And we see that uh, you have some hotspot situations in the city often coming with lower wind speed. You have a huge building capacity around and the wind is blocking and then you have pollution there. Couldn't go out. And this is mostly somewhere where also the people are, where they live or work. And, and just think about schools or kindergartens. They are mostly in the city and there we have really high pollution levels and it, it makes sense to place filters right there. 
So for all of our viewers who haven't experienced one of your solutions in, in real life, and uh, currently we, we saw them a few, few months ago, we had them in Berlin and many other places, but um, do, can you feel it? Is, it? is there a different temperature? Does it feel more refreshing? Or so? Especially in pandemic times like this, um, I believe you know your life has probably changed. Our, all our life has changed, but yeah. I think demand for your interest in your solution has probably grown a lot, or? Definitely it is. And um, to coming back to the, to the sensitive feeling, yeah. um, air pollution itself is really hard to, to smell or to, to, to measure. And therefore, uh, it's pretty interesting that we also cool the air and we moisture, re-moisture the air. And this is something you really can feel. When you sit in front of the city tree, the radius is about five to 10 meters where you can feel it. You see two to three degrees less, more temperature, especially in summer, a pretty nice feeling. You feel moistured air which is also uh, very positive in terms of corona transporting. Mm. Um, moisture air is very good. And you have the clean air. And these three things together um, creating this nice and tangible effect. So um, we, we mentioned already briefly that um, there are already a few cities where you placed your, your solution. Could you name a few where, yeah, please have a, have a drink first. Um, could you name already where, um, you know, where you have some, some pilot installations or some trials? For sure. So we were since 2015 active in the market and we have over 60 different projects all over Europe. 60 euro? 60. Wow. Yeah. And just also one in Hong Kong just to check out what the Asian market looks like. And it was pretty interesting with the first products to go into the market, see what works, what's not working out. Um, to be honest, we have also some mistakes and fails within the cities. And uh, now we are back with a serious production product, um, industrial standard with the City Tree 2020, so to say. And we are conquering right now the European metropoles like London. We are in Lisbon. We are here in Berlin. And there is more to come in the beginning of next year. You know, many of our viewers are from the digital signage, digital of home industry, and especially the digital of home people have recently really, you know, looked closer at solutions like you're offering. I mean, there are some really, you know, big ones, which are really active cooling, you know, from Mann and Hummel, these huge filters or so, yeah. um, but they also use some energy and uh, also some waste, <laughs> which is not, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, but um, I think you have a test, test la um, running with Deutsche Telekom, right? They have one of your city right. trees in, in Darmstadt or so? Yes also in, in Bonn in front of the headquarter. Um, so we also looking into this uh, out of home media and digital signage market because it's pretty interesting in terms of a business model. Um, and we see with our current product and we have also screens on it. It's uh, very interesting to, to share information, giving also some um, platforms for other people, our customers to showcase themselves, to present themselves. And we have a new um, product line coming up next year. It's called the City Tree 3.0, and it's uh, on one side, it's a, a huge uh, digital screen, and on the other side, it's the, the green and um, breathing filter system because we see this demand in the market. And we believe that just the signature uh, statue alone is not the additional value in the city. And we want to combine these multifunctional things where people are, they can breathe fresher air, and then they can also see these informations or get into communications is also interesting for cities. Especially within the corona, we see that they have to transform information to the people. Hey, now we have a problem, we have to go uh, into the lockdown or whatever. They need a communication tool to their inhabitants and we can deliver this. So you're merging the green city and the digital signage, digital of home world in one component? Definitely. We see this as a part of the smart city of tomorrow that you have always combined solutions. And that's, that's why we bring also city trees with uh, uh, electrical plug for recharging your vehicles. And we see always the multiple usage of things because we have just a limited space in the cities. And we think that things we bring into the cities should create a lot of more value just besides uh, just clean air or just presenting information. It should come all together. Really cool. Well, Peter, fantastic. It was great for having you, having you here and um, very exciting to hear that uh, next year we will see some more combined products and all the best for, for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicole, great to be here um, at Dan Perlman. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Well, this is not very easily explained because um, 20 years, you can imagine that we've been along for a long time and that we kind of developed a lot of different disciplines and also um, because we're very curious, we went into a different section. So, but nowadays we're an agency network based here in Berlin on this campus. We have more or less about 2,000 square meters. We've got 120 people working here. 
And uh, so, for example, one company my husband is running, they plan zoos, aquariums and leisure parks and also hotels. So everything that is um, a real destination. And my company, my side of the company, we're doing um, also mixed use destination development, shopping mall revitalizations, uh, retail revamps and store planning and stuff like that. Retail was really hard hit by uh, COVID crisis right now. How do you feel that? Um, are projects delayed, cancelled, or don't you feel a lot about it? Some clients got simply shock frosted and then they, they didn't do anything for a while until they just regathered momentum. Some are actually really gaining momentum, they're a real winner of the crisis and others still just a little bit hesitant to see how it's going. But the ones I like the best are actually the ones who are using the crisis as a massive chance for transformation. So what we see is an increase in demand on consultancy, digitalization, also um, new customer journeys, more customer centric thinking. So there is um, yeah, a huge change. Yeah, typical companies on the, on the winner's side are e-commerce companies. Um, but we see more and more of those um, e-commerce companies going into physical retail as well. I mean, we see examples like Mr. Specs, um, Optician, um, or Farad.de, a bike e-commerce e shop, uh, so two of the leaders uh, in Europe, going to physical retail. And you're involved in these kinds of projects. Can you talk about this a bit? Oh yeah, I absolutely love that. Because it's so great to work with pure player uh, in the digital sector because they have so much data. They're very agile, they're quick, they can change dramatically. And the minute they go to brick and mortar, they have this agility in head and the, they want to beat their test and then transform immediately. And that, because that means you just open the first store and then over a year, a period of two years, you gradually work on just improving the concept. And because they have the data, it's not a black box where you just do something and then you think maybe that was good, maybe it wasn't. Uh, or the weather was different at the time. <laughs> so but uh, so they, you can immediately improve the system. Online is known for efficiency, for being very um, very easy to, to use for, from a customer perspective, but not very well known um, for experiences. Mm -hmm. how, how do you teach online companies experience or do they have that internalized anyhow? Yeah, they have a different experience. They, they have different targets and this is actually the really what we're specialized is to to look at what is the customer journey for for a digital customer and then we take that and and we see how we can transfer that into physical retail without having a lot of digital surfaces because the funny thing is a customer the same customer on an online store behaves 100% differently than one in a physical retail space. So one concept you created uh, was Bonprix Connect Store in Hamburg. Can you talk about how this concept was created? The, the typical Bonprix customer, she doesn't wait, she's not waiting for digital services because she's so used to just have a lot of clothes, put them on your arms and then go with 20, 20 items into the dressing room, tiny dressing rooms, and then have a very great value for what you buy. And so she's not expecting huge service or an amazing attractive retail environment but what and that's why we actually tackled the customer journey and made sure that the services are very very discreet and that it just is a very beautiful world where you have a lot of inspiration and you see the styles on a runway and and you and everything is very close to you it's about proximate proximity and and emotions and then you just walk through and then you scan and the scan process is so light you don't have to go scan scan it just it recognizes it Im immediately and then you can just just pick all your favorite items you have a basket you say send that to my dressing room and within three minutes you have all your products in a dressing room that's big 
where you can change the light to the occasion and you can change as many times as you want. And normally if you're in a, in a, in a changing room, after the third time you, you're not a, you don't want to ask anymore to change it another time or another color. You need a lot of self-esteem to do that. But with the system you can change your stuff as much as you want. What were the key learnings? First of all, I talked to a lot of customers and they loved it. Especially what we thought would that older customers will have huge issues with the digital pro, uh, with the digital process, but they absolutely adore it because they said, first of all, the the people working there have a lot of time to consult because they don't need to fold away stuff all the time. So they have a lot of time for the customers. And secondly, they can take as much time as they want. They're not hushed through a process, through changing room or through payment process. They can do that and decide when they need help or when they don't. When we look a bit into the future. We love complex projects. <laughs> so the more complex, the better it is. And uh, where the where it's not precisely clear what the solution is to the problem. So, and that is what happens more and more that customers approach us and say, we just need younger customers or we need this or that or more turn turnovers or we want thousand stores in a billion turnover in five years. How can we do that? And this challenge is the best kind of how to work with because then we just, we have, uh, it just really comes to a point where you can start innovation because it is not we need a store or one pop-up or we need a street revitalization because then if you have this open questions you can really come up with really inventive new ideas. Welcome, welcome Professor Kai Tesla, Managing Director from German Out of Home Association. Um, great that you could make it, you came all the way from Frankfurt here to Berlin. And uh, yeah, it was a very special year, 2020. Amazing. Amazing, yeah, the pandemic changed almost everything. And, um, but Out of Home uh, was once one of these, you know, secret winners a little bit also. So how did the Out of Home develop in, in, in the industry this year? Actually, this year was quite tough for everybody. If you look at the figures, it's about 8.5% less um, gross income or turnover than the last years, which actually is um, not surprising because of the situation on the one hand side. On the other hand side, we had double digits growth last years. What's quite interesting is the role of digital, right? Yeah. I mean, digital started more than 10 years ago. Yeah. And in the beginning, it was a very difficult case, if, if you remember. Yeah. I mean, you worked for Stroer before. Yeah. Yeah, was <laughs> that, was, that was your business. Yeah. And it worked quite well in high frequented locations like yeah. airport, uh, st stations or airports or so. So what has changed since then? Why, is digital, why does digital home work today and didn't work 10 years ago? I think um, there are several reasons. Firstly, um, it was new, which of course was sexy on the one hand side. On the other hand side, it wasn't accepted as it is now. The second thing is that it developed lots of interesting touch points. As you mentioned, it started in the airports, it started in the train stations in Germany, it started in malls. And what you could easily see that the reach, the total reach was great on the one hand side. On the other hand side, clients didn't have spots, they didn't have the material, they didn't have a strategy to communicate. And I think what developed in the last years is that clients advertising, uh, advertising clients, that agencies made up their minds about um, how they could use digital out, use, use, use digital out of home. And, um, at the moment, there's so many touch points which are interesting if you target that I think um, the advertising spend finds its way into the public space. Digital has become or has come closer to the, to the road, yeah. to the street. Yeah. And, and secondly, in the 10 years ago or 15 years ago, the industry was more looking to get budgets you know, from TV. Yeah, right. And uh, now, because of programmatic and other things, you know, the budgets are coming more from the online or mobile world. Absolutely. And I think this has really, really changed. I think this is very important. If you, if you remember 10 years ago, the, the goal was indeed to go after TV businesses and TV budgets. And the idea, for example, from Streuer was to have a national network which has as much reach as a television channel. So um, that was the goal, and I think they fulfilled it somehow. On the other hand side, the, the second point is interesting. 
Because if you look at out of foam at the moment, data of mobile target groups plays a very important role. So if you look from a media perspective, people understand how clients, how, um, how businesses are moving, how people are behaving in public space, how they can be addressed. So you can use online and out of foam the same way. And you can understand how people are behaving, how they're moving, which are their mindsets in public space. And then you can target them not as easily as online, but the same way and the same, the same media strategy. That's very important. So the breakthrough for out of form or digital out of form was to leave the silo and to open up to, to the other media? Is that, is that yes, it? I think so. And especially if you look what happens at media agencies, because they decide where the money goes to. And um, they, 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 they gave up those silos. They started using DSPs to play out also digital out of form. So the, the track is you know, to follow the clients wherever they are, to understand if some contacts are doubled if you use online, mobile and digital out of home. And also the vendors, the media owners got smarter and they understood the way um, mobility can be used as a sales product as a whole. Mm. And that say, okay, you have to do this or this or this out of home channel. They understand that getting people in public space is the most important thing. And of course, digital out of foam is the fastest thing and the most flexible thing. Kai, I remember many years ago we talked about missing standards. Mm. And programmatic is not possible without standards. Yeah. That was yeah. always the biggest advantage of online, yeah. IAB, you know, across yeah, the yeah. world was the same thing. So lots of change that has changed there in IA digital out of foam, yeah. right? I think it has. Um, I think we're still not where we have to be. That's one of the most important things because if you look at this like like I do, I look at public space and find that for classic billboards, for digital out of foam, for digital inside several locations, it's not one standard yet. And I think it's very difficult because the perception of, of um, moving pictures is different to billboards. Mm. So you have to, it's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to have one fits all on one hand side. On the other hand side, you have to find the, you know, the, what is the smallest part that can be unified for all those media. And I think we're on track to do this. I would say in the last two years, in the next two years, there'll be a solution for an overall nucleus for a um, cross media measurement of out of foam. Data plays also mm. a huge role. I think data is so important because What happens at the moment that um, media people are trying or understanding the, 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 the value of geography added to um, classic online thinking. So um, I keep saying this is the outernet out there. It's not the internet, it's inside and the outernet is public space. But the data you can get from people is very um, close to their behavior, to their movement patterns, to their mindsets, if you want to use it. And the good thing is, looking at legal issues, you never address a single person. So you don't have the problems that they have in Germany at the moment um, in, in online. Um, you always address target groups. And if you use the data and understand how to, how to use the data, Targeting is one very important issue to push digital out of foam. We talked about the pandemic and mm -hmm. for us it was quite interesting that you know, the government, municipalities, mm. they started to understand what the power of digital out of home is. They always hate the screen and unfortunately, that's probably we have to mm. talk first. Uh, Amsterdam just a few days yeah. ago decided to ban mm. um, animation yeah. on, on digital screens mm. in the older cities. We have similar things in Munich, we have it over here in Berlin mm. also. Um, so do you think that the industry really understands or the municipalities and, and the governments really understand what out of home can deliver to their finances and to, to, to city life? I think they start to understand it. In Germany, um, I think about four weeks ago, there was a air raid alarm. So oh, that was a disaster. It Ooh. was a disaster. <laughs> and then I talked to people in several communities and they said the only system that worked was digital out of home. Mm. And they understood that digital out of home, because of this near time or near real time um, communication, can be used to address target groups which are on the street. That's one important thing. The other important thing is you reach people who don't watch television, who don't use the, the same online websites if you want to do alerts. Yeah. And I think 
there was a change of mind in the last four weeks that I understand. Kai, we could talk for hours and we have so many more topics in regards to smart cities. I think we just have to continue it in next year. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for, for coming over, especially coming over here to Berlin. And um, well, next year, I think it uh, can be the year of uh, out of home. Huh? I think so. I think so. I keep my fingers crossed, but I'm convinced it will be. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So we can take our, off our mask, I think. Um, Heinrich, you've been working at the forefront of uh, technology. So can you tell us a little bit about you, what you did, and what you're currently doing? So 2004 was uh, the year when I came to Berlin. At that time, a uh, member of, a, of an experiment, uh, to, to be frank. So um, Deutsche Telekom put a couple of people into Berlin and said, OK, it's obviously the German capital, but um, you know, there's not much going on. So, so we just had the bubble burst. Uh, the startup ecosystem basically had disappeared in Germany. The, the Neue Markt uh, had disappeared. Berlin had a, um, a almost 20% unemployment. There was not much going on. And people looked at me and said, Heinrich, what are you doing in Berlin? Uh, there's there's you know, nothing nothing to do for you. Uh, but, but in my back, I had this, this push and the drive, which I observed from the Chinese side. Uh, and I knew that on the technology side, there are a couple of things going on. So what I observed in these 16 years is the emergence of a software ecosystem that truly has uh, exceeded all my expectations. So you, you were one of the visionaries uh, for this ecosystem. I mean, you, you mentioned capital and, on, and all the other ingredients, but I think um, it also needs the visionaries who come to a place where there's not much and build it into something um, that's really relevant today. I think. Uh, it's, it clearly felt like this. So as a pioneer, you know, you, you, you are not the majority. People look at you and, and they're a little bit skeptic and say, you know, what, what are these people doing here? Like there was uh, Aaron Davidson from House of Platinum Ventures, you know, people from the universities, um, uh, Professor Albayrak and, and, and these folks, and, and there were not many. Um, so we, we could see that from a technology point of view, many things were coming together, but Truly, we were surprised by the effect ourselves. So we would not have thought that um, last year something like 3 billion euros would be poured into a city where the equivalent number in 2004 was just uh, 20 million. Let's take a look into the future. Um, what's your view on the next five years? And then probably also what's for you the next big revolution um, beyond that? I think that what we have now as Internet of Things and artificial intelligence is just an intermediary stage. So uh, software industry works on uh, doing everything real time. But that's just, that's just one step before projection. So what, what actually retailers, everybody wants to know is, you know, what, what will be your decision in three months from now? Uh, what, what will we buy and what will be available? What will be a good price for that? Um, and, uh, and actually you can do this uh, in theory and also on a, on a prototypical level um, that, that people take as many data as possible from the entire value chain, from your behavior and predict. Uh, and and um, we will see this in, in, in the big um, uh, e-commerce platforms that, that of course already now they go into prediction and, um, and the winner will be whoever has the best prediction model uh, because they can they can uh, they have um, you know better uh, bargaining position in contract negotiations because they they know already what what will be next uh, so two things number one from a technology side integrate as many data as possible and analyze in order to to extract patterns to know your decision our decision as customers as you know, responsible people in companies. And the second thing is, is the supply chain. So value chain, it's more, it will, I don't think it will be a chain in the future because we need resilience, it's more community. Having as many data available from this community about sustainability um, and, and potential risks, resilience, is toilet paper running out? I mean, you know, a silly thing, but, but um, it could, could uh, also be something like energy consumption, st energy status consumption. of screens. Right, um, and, and, and also the question, is my electric car really um, you know, environmental friendly or are all the rare metals uh, are destroying the um, uh, environment in South America? Who knows? But in the future, we will know. And, and these are the two important elements, the prediction of uh, what, what users um, will decide on and decision makers will decide on and you know, what happens in the supply chain, making it transparent um, and also accessible for, uh, for these decisions. 
So thank you very much, Heinz, uh, for, for this interview. Uh, I could go on for much, much longer with you and talk about the future, um, but uh, unfortunately, we only have limited time. If you have a solution for that, I'd, be, I'd go for it. <laughs> thank you very much as well. It was such a pleasure to talk to you, especially here in Berlin. Thank you. Welcome, Lee. Hi. Hi. Um, well, you're a Scottish architect living in, in Berlin for many, many years already. And um, tell us a little about your early days and how this has shaped the way you're creating immersive experience today. I moved to Berlin, um, God, a long time ago, so at the end of 1993. And yeah, as an architect, I was really taught, you know, how to solve a problem in space. That's really ultimately what, uh, what architects do. I was really quickly um, immersed in the electronic music scene of the city. So I started um, designing um, spaces, interiors of spaces using light. And the reason for this was because obviously a lot of those spaces were pop-ups, so you could basically flip on the switch and flip it off again and no one would know that you were there. So yeah, I, I kind of moved from creating um, or designing buildings and ideas into um, designing spaces with light, so really parties and art spaces and theater spaces and stuff like this. And uh, back then, you know, we weren't using kind of high-tech, uh, amazing, crazy 4D displays and all the stuff that we're using now, but we were using, when I first started, I was using slide projectors, Super 8 film projectors, 16 millimeter projectors, basically anything that I could find at the Russian flea market, which actually, I don't know if you know, but the Potsdamer Platz what used to be a Russian flea market. So that was the, the status of the city when I arrived. And so I would buy basically for one mark <laughs> or two mark. I would buy like a Super 8 film projector and I would shoot my own Super 8 films, you know, with different stuff, you know, route that I saw in the city, or I would, I would also, paint my own slides and stuff and I would really create environments using light from slide projectors and all that stuff. Um, I developed with technology which is obviously a very important part of what I do and obviously we're still developing with technology um, and after um, I think it was one big project that I managed to or that I was lucky enough to work on in Berlin 99 um, I realized like, oh, actually, this is not just a hobby. I could maybe, you know, make some money off of this. Yeah, we still create immersive spaces. Uh, we do it using different types of technology and the projects are different and bigger and smaller still and international and we work in different fields. But ultimately, the main point of creating a good immersive space, no matter what situation, is really about solving a problem, a spatial problem, and uh, that's really what I do and what I've been doing since the beginning. Fantastic. Talking about solving a problem, we live in pandemic times, unfortunately. Uh, everything is very difficult. And um, you realized a very interesting project for Deutsche Telekom. Yes. Could you elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was um, fortunate enough to work together with um, some other great creatives to co- yeah, to co-collaborate on this project, um, which was born out of the situation of the first lockdown um, in April, May. So the question was, you know, Deutsche Telekom, um, as a trusted companion, you know, and they, they already were working on this whole um, Dubai, hashtag Dubai sign uh, movement. So what could, what the, the problem was, or the question was, what can we do, you know, which is really, you know, um, immersing ourselves in, into the moment, you know, and into the moment of the pandemic and how can we create um, a project which, um, you know, which helps um, everybody and, and everybody in this moment, really, you know, and through many, many discussions and a lot of very collaborative uh, workshop ideas and stuff, uh, we came up with this idea of the Magenta Moon, which was basically a, a temporary, uh, uh, yeah, temporary event in Berlin. Uh, we went into a previous retail store um, at Potsdamer Platz, also actually just around here, but um, yeah, and we completely re redesigned and refurbished the space and created a crossover 
um, open space. There were many different things going on. This, the center of this um, of this space was an immersive environment, which was the Magenta Moon Garden, and it was really kind of dedicated to two main topics. You know, the one topic was kind of education through gamification. So how can we learn? You know, the the main theme of uh, the Magenta Moon was really you know digitale Bildung für alle. You know, how can we how can we help and what's the future of digital education and not just digital education for the schools, which is obviously a major topic, but uh, digital education for everybody from the simplest thing like, I don't know how to do a Zoom conference with my grandchildren, right? So you could really go into that space and have a one-to-one -one, uh, set up, you know, where you can ask whatever you want. It's not embarrassing or, you know, whatever, and you can get that information or, of course, you can... Uh, discover and experience this amazing um, immersive installations. Yeah, I, have, I have one question. Um, this is a fantastic, unique elements shows you, you, you created. You, do you also do something which is more scalable? Of course, yeah. I mean, we have lots of projects like that. Like we actually worked on the um, prototyping of the digital signage store for S. Oliver. Mm -hmm. um, so this was really, um, this is kind of a very perfect idea or example of digital signage. Um, and we do lots of things like this. We work for Marco Polo, we work for S. Oliver, we work for different brands um, where we're sometimes doing smaller things which are getting tested or things which then are scaled. Like for example, even for Hyundai, Uh, we also have a part of this experience in the showroom in Russia, in Moscow, and it's completely different, you know, so the content, of course, this is the big one, right, and this is the one that we work towards, but then afterwards we adapted this idea for lots of different environments and different screens and um, different formats and different types of technology and stuff, and that's very common for us. Yeah, but, but I think you're 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 an exception to that because there are many agencies who really you know are immersive and others are highly scalable things. And for us, a challenge we see is always you know how do you bring elements of this immersive, this unique experience you know to to hundreds or thousands of stores. And this connection is something which uh, I think it's quite un unique that you're offering that because many others say, oh no, I'm just doing the big thing and the other guys are taking care of the scalable stuff. So fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I, th I think like the reason why we're flexible enough to do that is because we started small and we still are quite small. Um, so we're, it's very important to me to be hands-on with the projects. So the team is not huge and we're very used to adapting for different markets and for different budgets. And because we're also motion designers and really focused on content as well, we have a design, a design department, so we can really just create something for any type of format as well. So it's, it's good to have this flexibility, I think. And I'm not sure if that's unusual, but it's, for us, it's kind of like, that's how it's been since the beginning. So it's not unusual for me. Giles, welcome. Um, glad to have you here. Um, Interactive Scape was uh, built since uh, 2008, I think, um, around multi-touch technology and ob object recognition. But the way we came across the company was more like uh, your creative concepts and what you can actually do with this technology. And uh, you're doing that across multiple verticals. You're doing it in, in retail, in exhibitions, in trade shows. So for many, many, many uh, different purposes. And the first case I'd like to talk to you about is the one we saw um, at ISE in Amsterdam uh, earlier this year. And it was a uh, data visualization um, of Berlin data through the centuries. And uh, I think I know this part. But can you explain a little bit what you did there? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, yeah, so the project you saw uh, was our Smart Cities project. So this was a demonstration app that we built to showcase, on the one hand, our technology solution, which is um, our multi-touch tables. So this is a large touch screen for multiple users to use simultaneously with object recognition. Um, so here we had the Kapoor Magnify. It looks like a magnifying glass in here. We can place this on the table, recognize the position and rotation, and then uh, react to this in the application. 
And then on the other side, we want to show, as you say, our creative um, software solutions which use this technology. So um, the app we built there, it had a, a map of Berlin. And then on the first level, what you could do was bring the magnified glass to the table, place it down, and then zoom in on different areas of the city. Uh, this is a really fun um, application of um, our technology, and it's also really nice to watch people who've never used it before, never seen this before, come up to the table and intuitively understand how they can zoom in, how they can zoom out, and have multiple people doing it. The next level was then to think not only how this could um, enable users to yeah, look at a map or something, but what we could then add on top of this. So we're not just having it as a magnifying glass, um, but we could then use it as a filter. So people could place down two of these objects um, and we could visualize traffic flow in different areas of the city. Um, there's a lot of companies which have a lot of data, for instance, yeah, traffic flow around the city is a great example. And um, being able to visualize this in this intuitive way is something which we really thought we could bring to this I, smart I city theme. I remember that. That was the, the biking schemes, I think, uh, between different points in, in the city, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was super interesting to then even... I, th I think what it enabled you to do is to, to think of the data in a different way and see it so visually um, and then to also imagine, oh, I wonder where most of the people from um, the airport, from Tegel, are cycling to or something. And you could then really just see this completely live on the application and you could interact with the data that you wouldn't be able to if it were just presented to you in a database or something. And what, what I liked about it, it was really, really intuitive. I mean, you, you take the thing and, and just move it around, uh, turn it, and it's, it's really something you do intuitively right uh, when you touch it. That's something we don't always see with digital technology. Um, sometimes you need the explanation, but uh, in this case, it, was, it really it just worked. Yeah, that's, um, I'd say that's what one of our strengths as a company is, is in being able to build these concepts with the technology that enable this um, completely intuitive use in the end. And that's one of our goals, is being able to use technology to enable people to intuitively interact with data and with each other. So, but the technology is only one part of the, the story. It's uh, really I mean, using this technology in concepts um, that then add value for the clients. Um, can you give us a couple more examples, maybe? Yeah, um, so we have um, the Mercedes-Benz showroom, where we've used our object recognition to take something like a car model, and this we is can... an Audi. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can make it a Mercedes as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can place this um, on the multi-touch table uh, and then react uh, appropriately to the model of car, whether it's an Audi or Mercedes, um, on the table and then have content, content react to this. So we built the... Um, Mercedes-Benz showroom. And this also enabled, um, not just as a place where people can come to the table and use this to uh, interact with the data themselves, but we had this con connected to a huge projector um, so that this can be used as a presentation tool. Um, and I think this makes an excellent case for using this as a, as a presentation tool that you then um, are connected in this way and can, can display the data to people. Um, we also have the, the Siemens Energy showroom in Berlin. Um, which is where we've used one of the first examples of our Scape X technology, which is our, the next generation in our object recognition. And there people can come and learn about um, renewable energies, energy sources in Berlin, and interact with all of these data sources in playful and interesting ways to see what happens if in five years we change the amount of renewables by 5% and look at all the knock-on effects and be able to have these, these live visualizations. Really cool, but making things easy for the user most of the time means uh, putting some or a lot of effort uh, into the projects. So what are your typical, typical challenges um, in projects? Well, we have, of course, making these projects isn't simple. Uh, but we have a lot of experience in doing this and really um, this internal knowledge we have in the company and our developers are experts at doing this and so we're able 
uh, to realize these projects pretty well by now, I'd say. Um, there is often a challenge in just being able to communicate how many different possibilities there are in, with, in terms of object recognition on a multi-touch screen, because this is probably something that a lot of people haven't seen before. Um, we're obviously internally very um, well acquainted with the technology and we, we are good at visualizing the possibilities, but sometimes being able to communicate that um, just how, many, how broad uh, the applications are and how this could apply to all different companies from different verticals. So it's more a matter of uh, creativity and uh, building the right concepts around this technology than that there's a real technology limit. Yeah, um, I would say it goes both ways. So without the technology, um, we, can't, we can't do anything. So I'd say the, um, the technology informs the concepts, but also um, the concepts can help inform where the technology should go. So at our heart, we're a technology company and we're constantly innovating in the technological space. So then our next generation of tables, the Skate X, have a built-in um, artificial intelligence module to help understand what's happening on the table. Um, and this came from what we saw was possible and what we realized we could do with such a technology for our projects. So it's really moving both ways, moving the technology ahead and then moving or finding new concepts. Um, next question, I mean, you, you're working a lot with data because um, I mean, that's uh, the things you, you try to visualize. Um, so is there a minimum requirement on, on the client side in terms of data? Um, we're very happy if a company comes to us with a lot of data and wants to know how to present it. So that's something which we can use our tools to solve their problems. And I think that is what happens in a lot of cases. A company wants to be able to sh um, share their data or visualize their data or to be able to interact with their data. And we can do this um, in a very intuitive way, but um, it really depends on the client's needs. So we will look at the, the client's story and what story they want to tell. And many of our projects could be using our CMS, um, our content management system, where the clients can put in what, whichever part of their data they want to tell whatever story they want. So super exciting technology, super exciting projects. Um, is there anything that you are dreaming of realizing with this technology? Yes, so our ScapeX technology with artificial intelligence module is our next generation of uh, object recognition. So this allow has allowed us already to implement smaller markers than ever before, and also completely transparent markers. But then taking this to the next level, what we can do is we can recognize people's um, handheld devices. So their mobile phones or their um, tablets when they're placed on top of the multi-touch screen. Oh, cool. So um, I, can, I could bring my own phone and just place it on the, on the screen. So and, and what would happen then? So one demonstration we have with this um, technology is that two people can bring their phones to the table, can take a photo from their phone, bring it out onto the multi-touch table, work with this together, edit, and then share it to the other person's phone. And as soon as you take yours away from the screen, you then are in your private sphere. So it's about the combination of these private spheres, which we're used to, um, on our own devices and then bringing this into a communal space. Um, so I would say our dream project is really what we're working on at the moment, which is our Scapex mobile. Um, so working together on an interactive table is really great, but in current COVID times, it's sometimes difficult to bring people into one room and really have them interact on one table. Do we have solutions uh, that solve that problem too, having people remote in remote locations? Yeah, so the current situation has obviously affected our business with a lot of it happening at trade shows or exhibition spaces. But we see that what our clients really want, perhaps more than ever, is still to be able to um, communicate and work together with these um, digital projects. Uh, so we've invested in remote access uh, of our 
digital applications, creating a digital twin where people can collaborate remotely and interact and together in an intuitive way. Oh, that's really cool. So in, in separate locations, I could see what you're doing uh, on your table, your end of the table, and I would see it and could uh, really interact with you at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just a matter of building this technology to from taking from a video conference um, and then you can imagine the extrapolation of this yeah. where we're not just seeing one screen, but we're also managing to click in different parts or point things out um, and see and then actually interact with each other and with the digital twin that we've created. One of your current projects is uh, at Tacheles here in, in Berlin. Can you tell us a bit more about that one? Yeah, so this is a real estate project, um, an extremely premium project, which is a large real estate project in Berlin that's happening. And what we've done together with our sister company, Werk 5, um, who's a model building company, is that we've helped to create the showroom where people can come and view all of the apartments that are there. So we have multiple uh, beautiful models created by Werk 5. And then together with these, there's an application connected. So a large multi-touch screen, which slides out. And then you can view not only the model itself, but we have connected through, um, we have this connected so that you can view the apartments and then they'll light up on the model. And then you can explore a virtual Berlin inside the application, see what the view looks like from the apartment, etc., etc. So it takes the selling to a whole different level then. Absolutely. It really helps you visualize what the project is going to be like uh, in the end and I think really brings a lot of value for the customer. Thank you very much, Giles. Thank you. That's it from Berlin, but we have much more to come in the next weeks and months. And please send us more of the feedback. It's really, really great how much feedback we receive from you via mail in the comments here at YouTube. And it's fantastic for us to get this feedback and to learn more about what really interests you. So in the next couple of weeks, we will travel to Barcelona, to Zurich, to London, to many other places, also to Asia. So if you have any projects there, if you know an integrator, if you know something which we should really visit, please send us a mail and we are happy to include the next program. So thank you for watching Invitus Meets Worlds and see you soon on this channel.